We've already talked about the factors that a president considers when deciding who to nominate to the Supreme Court. Now let's consider the process that the executive branch follows before actually making a nomination. The process is typically led by the Attorney General who establishes a team comprised of members of the Department of Justice and the White House staff. Members of the Department of Justice are there to provide legal advice and members of the White House staff are there to provide a political perspective. And their job is to compile a list of possible nominees for the president to consider. And of course, as part of this process, the president typically will consult with members of his own political party in the Senate, both to see if they have any suggestions for the list and also to see if there are any problems or potential problems with people on the list that might cause their nominations to run into trouble. As we noted in class, Republican presidents in recent years have picked more and more judges who are from the Federalist Society. And in fact, uh, Donald Trump said specifically that he would not nominate anybody who wasn't endorsed by the Federalist Society. So the list of judicial nominees in the Trump administration is essentially written already uh, by the Federalist Society. There is, at the U.S. District Court level, something known as senatorial courtesy. Now, the U.S. District Courts, of course, are the nation's lowest courts that do not cross state borders, so they're contained within individual states. And typically, a president will not nominate anyone to the U.S. District Court if that person's opposed by a senator from that state from the president's political party. Once upon a time, senatorial courtesy was extended to members of the other political party, but of course, as Washington has become more partisan, uh, now it only extends to members of the president's political party. Uh, during this period of time, uh, the nominee will undergo uh, rigorous investigations into their background, of course, by the press and public, but official investigations by the FBI, who conducts a criminal background check to find out if the person has ever been convicted or arrested or otherwise come into contact with the law. And they go beyond that as well, of course, to try to ferret out ethical problems in the, in the candidate's background, whether or not they violated the law, uh, because, of course, you want to save the nominee from potential embarrassment and perhaps not nominate them uh, if they've done something that might uh, stop them from uh, being confirmed. Now, this process broke down in 1987 with the nomination of Douglas Ginsburg to the Supreme Court. Ronald Reagan had nominated Robert Bork, who had been rejected by the Senate, and he was desperate to find a replacement nominee, and they rushed and did not conduct a sufficient background check, and after the nomination was made, it was discovered that Douglas Ginsburg had smoked marijuana. And this may not seem like a big deal to you today, but this was the first time uh, that a major political figure had been found to have smoked pot at some point in their past. And this uh, led to several other individuals coming out and admitting that they had smoked pot. And in fact, um, when Bill Clinton a few years later had to say, you know, yes, I smoked pot, but I didn't inhale, uh, all of that was a response to Douglas Ginsburg's nomination and in fact it had to be withdrawn because support among Ginsburg among Republicans collapsed. Anthony Kennedy became the next nominee. In addition to the FBI's criminal and ethical background check, the Department of Justice will conduct a check of the candidates past views and statements. Uh, looking into opinions they may have written, looking into speeches they may have given, or books or law review articles they may have written, not only to discover uh, and make sure that their views are compatible with the president's views, but also to make sure that they haven't said anything or that will uh, cause them to be rejected by the Senate, perhaps something very embarrassing or something extreme. Uh, that would cause the Senate to reject them. Uh, the last thing a president wants is their nomination to be rejected, which happens about 20% of the time in American history. Uh, about one out of every five nominations has had to have been withdrawn or has been rejected outright. Now, before the president actually makes the nomination, they usually meet with the nominee 
in the vast majority of all cases, the president does not know uh, the nominees personally, and so they usually meet with them before announcing. Uh, they want to feel comfortable with the person that they're going to place on the nation's highest court for the rest of their lives. These meetings are typically kept secret, and in fact, the executive branch goes to great lengths to try to keep them secret so the press doesn't find out about them and leak the name of the nominee um, because presidents like to keep it secret. They like to keep it uh, dramatic and make the announcement dramatic. And indeed, eventually uh, the president will choose one person and will make an announcement. It's usually made in a very formal setting, typically uh, the east wing of the White House. and. It's a affair full of pomp and circumstance. The nominee typically brings every single family member and friend they have. Uh, so there's a big cheering section for them. They're proud of their uh, successful friend and family member. Uh, the president, of course, lauds the candidate, their experience, their uh, judicial temperament, their uh, law school education. And presidents almost always do the same thing. They argue that their candidate was chosen on the basis of merit alone. The only consideration the president has was picking the best person in the country for the office. And the president asserts, of course, that any opposition to the candidate then must be political, because if this is the best candidate, then anybody who says otherwise must be motivated by base politics. And only after the president speaks does the candidate get an opportunity to speak, and they take great pains to make sure that they say nothing controversial. Uh, they talk about how humbled they are and their respect for the law, uh, their respect for the president who nominated them, uh, but certainly nothing controversial, and they typically do not take questions uh, at this announcement. The period between the time the President makes his announcement and the time that the Senate Judiciary Committee begins its hearings is known as the interim period, and this usually lasts two to three months. And this is the period of time in which interest groups and others get the opportunity to weigh in and start to investigate the candidate and to make their views known. Uh, they do begin to conduct in intensive investigations similar to those that were conducted by the Department of Justice and the FBI. And the first 48 to 72 hours are very crucial in this process. And in fact, within the first day or two, you can usually tell whether the nomination is going to sail through fairly easily, uh, whether they're going to run into trouble, um, and what the main issues in opposition to the nomination might be. Um, so usually, although the interim period usually lasts two to three months, uh, usually the first two to three days uh, are very telling in what's eventually going to happen. Now typically, uh, opponents are the first to strike, although this seems to be changing. Uh, opponents will run ads and do other things to indicate uh, their displeasure with the nomination, and then they'll typically be followed by supporters of the nomination. Uh, and the lobbying is intense for Supreme Court nominations. Of course, they can consist of in-person lobbying by various interest groups, their representatives meeting with senators, uh, going on the various media outlets and giving interviews, uh, encouraging constituents and others to uh, mail in or phone in or send emails to or have an online petition for or against a particular candidate. Um, and as part of this, uh, the nominee themselves will travel to Capitol Hill uh, they meet with every member of the Senate Judiciary Committee privately in their own offices and uh, they then also try to meet other important senators, as many senators as they can, um, in order to try to gain their support. Now, in order to understand the process and the politics of Supreme Court nominations today, one must understand and be familiar with the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court in 1987. The nomination of Robert Bork and the hearings that followed were transformative events, uh, not only for the politics of the Supreme Court, but for the politics of the nation generally. And in fact, uh, political pundits will still use the verb, you got borked, 
uh, to uh, describe what happened to him uh, when it happens to other people. So this is a seminal moment in American politics. So Robert Bork was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1987. Uh, Lewis Powell, a classic swing vote, was retiring from the court and Ronald Reagan nominated Robert Bork. Robert Bork was by all accounts a very smart man, a very capable man, a very qualified man. He was a leading uh, legal intellectual, had written law review articles, uh, books. Um, he had written many opinions as a judge. Uh, that uh, had gained quite a bit of notice and uh, he was also very very conservative very conservative uh, so he was very smart and very conservative nobody could say that he was unqualified to sit on the Supreme Court from a perspective of pure merit but his views tended to alarm uh, liberals very much uh, as the most notable example of uh, his conservative views, Bork had argued that Brown v. Board of Education, which said that segregated schools were unconstitutional, that that decision was wrongly decided. And although during the nomination he uh, backtracked and tried to say that he would accept Brown v. Board of Education, uh, the fact of the matter was uh, he, he had indeed argued that uh, that decision was, was wrong and that created a great sense of panic among liberal interest groups. And the nomination, although this is typical today, uh, it was not usual for interest groups to take out ads and to wage public opinion campaigns for or against a Supreme Court nominee until Robert Bork. And uh, liberal interest groups, as soon as he was nominated, started attacking him. Uh, they started running ads. And the most famous of those were, were this. I'm going to show you this ad right now. Uh, this ad starred Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck was one of the leading actors of the time, very, very well respected. And notably, he had starred as Atticus Finch in the movie adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, so his, um, his standings on issues of race uh, were impeccable. So this ad is a classic example of the kind of ad that was run against Robert Bork uh, that was novel back then, but that is uh, very uh, common today. There's a special feeling of awe people get when they visit the Supreme Court of the United States, the ultimate guardian of our rights as Americans. That's why we set the highest standards for our highest court justices, and that's why we're so concerned. This is Gregory Peck. Robert Bork wants to be a Supreme Court justice, but the record shows that he has a strange idea of what justice is. He defended poll taxes and literacy tests, which kept many Americans from voting. He opposed the civil rights law that ended whites-only signs at lunch counters. He doesn't believe the Constitution protects your right to privacy. And he thinks that freedom of speech does not apply to literature and art and music. Robert Bork could have the last word on your rights as citizens. But the Senate has the last word on him. Please urge your senators to vote against the Bork nomination. Because if Robert Bork wins a seat on the Supreme Court, it will be for life. His life and yours. Of course, nowadays such ads are common. Here's an anti-Brett Kavanaugh ad. Well, that's it for this lecture. Next, we'll consider what happens when the nominee appears before the Senate Judiciary Committee.